Well, I know you're here because you care about what's going on with your kids and what's going on in school and some dangerous things that you've been hearing in your community and from your kids and from your neighbors. And I want you to know that we're here, the police department is here, a number of us representing uh, the department tonight, because we also care. And we're here to support you. We're here to be a heavy hand if we need to be. We're here to arrest those that need to be arrested and get them into the system if that's what it takes. But tonight, um, I brought three people with me. Well, I've actually brought more than that, haven't I? Sorry, guys. No disrespect. I brought five with me. Um, three that will be featured uh, just briefly here now, and they'll also be available after uh, my brief section here for a lot of questions that you may have. Um, before I introduce the first person I want to bring out, uh, I just wanted to share with you that I am a parent of teenage boys, two of them. And uh, one thing that I learned as a parent uh, early on, and you may have heard this before, this may not be original material, but uh, these little suckers do not come with an owner's manual. And uh, despite the best efforts of a parent unit or a, you know, an individual parent, if that's the case, sometimes we don't do the best we can for these guys and these little gals, and we make mistakes too. But the one thing that I've learned and the one thing that seems to be a little bit too prevalent uh, in regard to the problems that we're facing today with our young people uh, sometimes relates to us and our willingness to look the other way, our willingness to not want to know as much as we should. And those are the things that I want to charge you with tonight briefly here before I bring these guys out. It's so easy for me to sit in my bed at night when I know my 16-year-old is coming home, and when that door opens, or the garage door opens, and I hear him come in and brush his teeth and go to bed, you know, I feel good. Hey, mission accomplished. My kid is home safe. I can now go to sleep and sleep well tonight. What I don't know is what conditions he's in, what condition he's in, who he was with, what he did. I know what he told me he was going to do. So I occasionally do an audit and stay up and ask him tough questions. Hey, come here. Where were you? Now, of course, my kids are at an incredible disadvantage because they're my kids, and I am trained in how to detect people that are being dishonest, and they have told their friends for years that I am screwed because my dad's a cop, and I have to tell them the truth, and, but, but they don't always, uh, and sometimes they're pretty convincing. And it, what it takes for you is whether you're good at detecting deceit or not, you have to ask those questions. You have to engage these kids, and you have to follow through. Uh, you just, you have to. And it's uncomfortable. You don't, sometimes you don't want to know the answer. I, I can tell you with 100% certainty that some of the things my 16-year-old has told me, I really didn't want to hear. But he told me, and I'm grateful that he did. He didn't tell me the first time that I asked either. He didn't tell me the second time that I asked. But eventually, we kind of broke down some barriers and had some open conversations. So that head in the sand mentality is comfortable. It's easy, it's, you know, they're coming home at night and they're like um, Dr. Walker said, if they're getting good grades in school, you know, hey, what have I got to worry about? Well, the fact of the matter is that you can help your kids and you can help your family and you can help your schools by, by keeping them honest and the trust and verify thing is great advice. Um, so anyway, I'll be available for questions at the end. Uh, I wanna bring out the first of three folks that are gonna speak to you briefly about three different aspects of the problem that we're seeing. The first is Lieutenant Andrew Papachok, who is one of our, that's a mouthful, huh? Lieutenant Andrew Papachok. He is a patrol lieutenant, and he's going to talk to you just for a few minutes about um, the laws as it re relate to marijuana and the changes that have recently happened. Lieutenant Papachok. Thank you, sir. So I'm going to set down my paperwork real quick here, um, just so I'm getting all my facts right. I don't want to give any bad information to you guys. So as you know, Initiative 502 passed recently. And it's brought up a lot of questions about what's legal and what's illegal. Um, so I wanted to go over that with you to begin with. Um, the law breaks it into a very hard point of 21 years of age. Uh, right now, uh, I don't know if everybody's aware, but marijuana comes in many different forms. And the law addresses the three main forms and the amounts you can keep. It's different for each form. So if I know the, you watch TV, they'll show somebody smoking a joint, and that's what people picture marijuana as. But nowadays, with Initiative 502, you're going to see marijuana in many different forms. So uh, just Washington State, it allows you one ounce of usable marijuana. That's what you picture, the bud, uh, the, the uh, marijuana joint. That's the usable marijuana. 
but the law also addresses the uh, solid form, which is 16 ounces of solid form. This can be brownies, this can be bread, this can be food product. So if you see food product, it may, not, it may contain marijuana. So uh, be aware that there's been instances in other areas of the country where you have marijuana being actually hidden in food product. So consider that as a fact when you're looking at marijuana, it's not the blunt you see on TV always. The other is liquids. Um, there's been many cases in the news now about hash oil. Uh, basically, they're taking flake marijuana, using butane to heat it up, and extracting the oil from it. That's a liquid form. Washington State law allows 72 ounces of marijuana-infused product in liquid form. So you can actually have liquid marijuana now. So it's not just, I, I just want to instill in you that it's not just what you see on the, the old movies or TVs where it's somebody smoking a blunt. That's not marijuana legally in Washington State. So let's discuss what's illegal. Um, 21, uh, most importantly to you guys, 21 and younger, it is legal to have marijuana. Uh, the question comes up as far as DUIs. DUIs, it's zero, zero for marijuana for juveniles. No, there's no marijuana allowed for juvenile DUIs. Uh, people always ask the question of, is the 502 changed the way we do DUIs? And really, it hasn't. We've been arresting people for drug driving before 502. We arrest people for drug driving after 502. I'm sure there's two traffic guys here that can answer more questions about that. There are experts in that. Um, and I'd encourage you to ask them questions about the DUI process. But you know, we've arrested them before. We're going to continue to arrest people that drive drunk or drive on drugs. It's still just as illegal. The one thing that people or parents sometimes don't understand, too, is that marijuana paraphernalia was legalized under Initiative 502. Uh, when you discuss uh, bongs and all the stuff you saw up there, it is now legal for children or children, anybody under 21 years, to possess it. You cannot have trace inside of it. Once there's trace inside of it, it's illegal for them, but they can have bongs, they can have pipes, they can have stems. All that stuff is legalized now. Oh, I'm sorry. My apologize. I'm going too fast on the legal versus illegal. Um, so... Marijuana pipes, stems, those are all legal for anybody under 21 years of age to have. They just can't have anything inside of them. You can own the glass pipe, you can own the bong, they can own the bong, but they can't have any trace marijuana inside of the bong itself. So that is something in the law that legalized things that were paraphernalia before, are now drug paraphernalia before, which were illegal, they're now legalized under the law as well. The law also says that and if you're 21 and over, you cannot use that device to use anything but marijuana inside of it. The other last thing I wanted to uh, speak about was the e-cigarettes that you see. E-cigarettes can have marijuana inside of them. You get inserts that are THC. So just be aware when you see e-cigarettes, that may be something you want to check as well. Everybody know what those are, e-cigarettes? Yeah. Vapors, yep. Vapor cigarettes. You'll see little, um, I I'd, I'd highly recommend Google's your best friend when it comes to this for pictures. Go to Google Images and type in e-cigarette, and it'll show you pictures of all the items that we're going to discuss. Or if you have questions about them during the forum later, we can discuss that as well. Thank you, Lieutenant Popchuk. Uh, next, yeah. So like I said, he'll, he's not going anywhere. He'll be around not only to answer your questions kind of up here on stage or wherever we're doing that, but also afterwards as well. Uh, next, I want to bring out Lieutenant Marsha Harnden. Lieutenant Harnden is the supervisor of our traffic unit. And she is also a drug recognition expert. And no, you may not have her cell phone so that you can call her anytime you need her. <laughs> However, there are a lot of people like Marsha available in our area. Uh, and just because somebody's not, if someone's impaired but not necessarily under the influence of alcohol, that does not mean that we cannot, no, I shouldn't do it, you double negative, that we can still investigate and we can still make arrests. And Marsha's going to tell you more about that. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Chief, for that introduction. Uh, my name is Marsha Harden. Uh, I was an SRO for a long time in the Bellevue School District, so uh, if some names and stuff sound familiar, that's probably where you uh, know me from. Uh, as the Chief indicated, I am a drug recognition expert. What that means is that I go through extensive schooling to recognize the signs and symptoms of people impaired by certain classifications of drugs. We talk about drugs in a little bit different manner than perhaps the medical professionals do. We have seven drug categories that we look at. Alcohol is the primary. It's called a, a depressant. Cannabis is one as well. So I'm trained to look at all the different signs and symptoms. And I'm sure a lot of you are going to have questions, and I'm happy to answer them tonight about what will I see if I think my kid is high. 
It's a little bit different than what you might see if they're drunk. It, it has a different effect on the human body. Two of my other DREs are here and we can answer some questions for you. Uh, the importance and kind of the point I wanted to bring out after talking to Chief uh, Johnson tonight is that, uh, as a good doctor said too, we're seeing a rapid increase in marijuana DUIs, almost to the point that it's scary. Uh, my first call out as a DRE was in 2006. I was called to Evergreen Hospital to evaluate a 16-year-old who had smoked a bowl at a party because he didn't want to get caught because he was on uh, probation for an MIP for alcohol. So he figured it was okay to smoke a bowl rather than drink alcohol. On his way home, he crossed the center line on Avondale Way and hit a King County Sheriff's deputy head on and broke both of his legs. So uh, I have a, a very strong feeling about marijuana. I was very disappointed to see it pass. I understand that it was a, a popular vote, but I wish we had more time to prepare because I think it came on us so quickly and the education is not there. It took us probably 50 years to convince people about the dangers of cigarettes and alcohol. So we're gonna have to make up decades on, on educating people on the dangers of marijuana and driving. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you have afterwards. Uh, about uh, cannabis or heroin is another one that's coming at us. I would agree with that statistic as well. So, welcome. Thank you, Marcia. Hey, well, so for plugging um, former SROs, I was actually the first SRO at uh, Newport High School before we really had the program. I was a temporary uh, SRO, and I, I must have been okay because it became a real program after that. So, taking full credit. This is Lieutenant Joe Nault. Uh, Joe is the supervisor of all of our SROs in Bellevue and has a unique perspective um, from his folks that work for him as to what they're seeing in school right now today. So, Lieutenant Nault. Sorry, School Resource Officer, SRO. You know, cops, we use acronyms for everything. SRO, thank you for, for keeping me honest on that. Yeah, so just to give a little bit more background on our program, we have six officers assigned to the middle schools and the high schools. And uh, their assignment they is in the school, and that's all they do. They're from the time they start their shift to the time they're in their shift. And they also handle some calls related to the school uh, in the surrounding neighborhoods. A lot of the calls uh, that they handle are actually situations that may be occurring at the home of the student, but they manifest in the school through a school counselor or a CPS referral, things like that. But so that's kind of the SRO program in a nutshell. Um, you know, in addition to the uh, to the marijuana and alcohol, which are the two big issues, uh, there's several emerging trends that we've seen in the last few years. Uh, one of them was referred to earlier, and that is uh, the increase in use of hash or hash oil, which is a concentrated form of marijuana. It's often smoked in uh, <coughs> the e-cigarettes now more and more. Um, we're also seeing uh, what's called Molly. I don't know if you, any of you have heard that, but that's kind of a concentrated form of MDMA or ecstasy. Uh, it's been purified and, and it tends to be very expensive, but it's becoming more prevalent, so the price, pain, price point may be going down. Uh, and then, uh, as has also been said, uh, increases in heroin. Um, and this is kind of on the heels of when oxycontin and oxycodone and hydrocodone uh, were you know, so problematic and addictive because they're opiates, and then steps were taken to put it behind the counter in, in uh, pharmacies, and then now they're reformulating how it's made. And, and so what's happened is that people, since it's an opiate, have kind of reverted to the original opiate, which is heroin, and the price point has gone way down for that too. Um, I was a narcotics detective for several years, and at, when I left in 2010, an ounce of heroin was not a whole lot more expensive than an ounce of marijuana. And so um, heroin's coming back too. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that we're seeing alcohol related is uh, the energy drinks with alcohol. And you know, this is a, it's an insidious kind of marketing campaign because they're always packaged in brightly colored cans. That attracts kids, that's by design and you have these high, high concentrations of both caffeine and alcohol, and you can just imagine what that does to a system, especially in a developing person. So uh, those are just some things that we are seeing in general on, in addition to the same baseline levels of 
marijuana and alcohol use that we've grown accustomed to seeing all these years. So. Uh, thank you. I want to be respectful of our time that we have allowed. And I know that was just a lot of information in a short amount of time. But like I said, we'll be here and we'll be available for questions. And you know where to find us, too. Uh, if if we, your question doesn't get answered tonight or an issue pops up for you that you'd like to talk to one of us or somebody else about, we're happy to do that. So thank you very much for being here and for caring so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. That's awesome. Next, I'd like to introduce Mr. Paul Weatherly. He is the current director of Alcohol and Drug Counseling Program at Bellevue College. Myth has been driven by not only the proponents of marijuana and the people who grow it and want to sell it and want to make money and, and provide a product, but it's also been created by, uh, within the world, the clinical worlds of treatment and in some ways in the worlds of law enforcement as well. And so there ends up being a lot of very extraordinary mixed messages about what marijuana is and is not. And so um, <clears throat> I, I think that uh, in knowledge, within knowledge lies power. And the, the part of the problem here is uh, that as Google was mentioned earlier, if you type the word marijuana into the search bar for Google and press search, you will get 33.3 million entries in less than 30 seconds. I'm sure you all have time to cruise through each of them to see what they have to say. A lot of times what you'll find is that about 45% of these entries will tell you things like marijuana is the worst evil, it is the uh, botanical equivalent of the, devil's hand, the idle hands that make up the devil's workshop. Then you're going to find about 45% of those entries that are going to tell you if we just smoked enough pot, we'd have world peace and everything would be great. <laughs> you know, and then you have this, this middle ground, uh, about 10% where you can find really good information about what this is and what this is not. One of the things that I find unfortunate today as an educator is that the internet is not the open source it was 10 years ago when I was able to basically enter things in my search engine like the Journal of the Royal Dutch Medical Association and I could go straight to their homepage and then I could do searches on things like marijuana in the respiratory system, marijuana in the reproductive system, now what happens is it says, please enter your username and PIN number, and if you don't have one of those, this is how you can subscribe. And so we're, we've lost a lot of opportunity to find some of the most reputable sources of information about marijuana. Um, the Dutch do wonderful work on this. Uh, the Australians do, the New Zealanders do, the French do. Uh, the British do, the Canadians have it as well. All through their, their uh, research primarily on marijuana and also looking at marijuana as a medication. Um, I will take uh, um, one subtle distinction with this. Uh, this is uh, the, probably the biggest beef I have about marijuana today. Um, I know that the statute of limitations has passed, so I can talk about the fact that I used to sell, grow, and use marijuana back in the day. And um, I can tell you, having looked at thousands and thousands of marijuana plants and have playing with them, to this day I cannot tell you what part of the marijuana plant is medical and what part of it is recreational. It looks like a marijuana plant to me. And I think what happens is that we end up having this conversation about marijuana from two different sides. One is that cuddly, feel-good, laugh and giggle feeling that you can get recreationally. And then there's that, does this have potential therapeutic value for people? And there's all sorts of really good research that shows 
how that can be, how that works and how it doesn't work. But the thing that concerns me most is that I-502 specifically said that there would be no changes in Washington State's medical marijuana law. What I think frustrates many of the parents that I talk with is that they don't realize that in Washington State and under federal law, once you turn 13 years old, you can seek medical attention without your parents' permission. And I cannot tell you the number of young men and women I've met when I get the opportunity to talk about this stuff in high school health classes and talk about this with kids who are in residential treatment who all have legitimate documentation to possess marijuana because they have been authorized to use it by a qualified health care professional. And this is and, and this is the thing. So it, it presents many challenges for us where on one hand we have a law that says you cannot use, possess, or or have any marijuana on your person at all if you're under the age of 21. But if you have a recommendation from a healthcare provider, you can't. And this is kind of a lot of the stuff we're seeing. I talk with kids a lot about terminology, uh, the way they describe things. That's one of the great things about generations is that every generation seems to develop their own language to describe what they want to talk about so we don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> and when you look at uh, marijuana, there's all sorts of language, like there's a term called dabbing. So I find some of my best experts are young people, so I ask. So what's dabbing? And they would describe that to me, and I'd say, oh, you know, back in the 70s, we used to call that hot knifing, and I'd explain that to them. And they go, well, dude, that's just dabbing. <laughs> so part of this is being able to understand how different generations create their own language to describe the things they're doing, not necessarily that they're doing it differently. The one thing that, that, I, that, that we can say is that over the years, we could say that marijuana today is no longer your grandma's marijuana. It is much more potent, and there are lots of hybrids, the genetic hybrids of this stuff, that um, make uh, what people might have been smoking back in the 60s and 70s, maybe even into the early 80s, nothing in comparison to what this is. And so what we see is that damage and then what I hear from a parent um, um, in clinical settings um, is phrases like, well, you know, at least it's only marijuana. It's not like those really hard, bad drugs. And what we find is that when I'm meeting the young people in treatment, um, they may or may not have started with marijuana, but marijuana became part of their routine. But a lot of times the reason they're in treatment and the reason there has become a crisis that within that family that has put parents in a position that they're going to turn their children over to the care of other professionals to be able to see if there's something we can do about a problem. The crisis could have been intervened on so much earlier because we could have said, hey, let's learn about what you're doing. Um, I know that when I talk, um, especially with young people here at other high schools, um, there will be uh, the cell phone. It's a marvelous little, little instrument because I will say something about marijuana that may challenge the belief system of people who like to use marijuana. And they will immediately go on their cell phone and cite many internet resources as to why I am wrong. And I ask them things like, how do you know that's the truth? And they go, well, it's on the internet. And I'm like, sure, and I'm a French model. <laughs> you know, uh, I can post myself that way on the internet. If I want. It would be scary, but I could. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of times I think it's part of how we have that conversation. But I think also it's part of how do we find ways to help young people understand 
how to evaluate the information that they have that they have access to. Um, I see kids using drugs that when it comes to the idea of being in the recovery process are so overwhelmed by the amount of information they have at their fingertips that they don't even know how to begin to uh, decipher it all and how to be able to pick out what is that, uh, what is that little piece of wisdom that might be in that piece of research that says maybe what that bald guy was talking about in treatment is the truth. You know, what is that little piece of, of information that's on a website um, that can say something about what that piece of paraphernalia is like or what that, uh, um, what, uh, what the pros and cons are of something. I know that, you know, with, within, with doing this, you get to see all of these different types of types of things. So there's some, there's some, uh, one of the great and most uh, uh, famous mixed messages of all occurred between 1936 and 1942. In 1936, marijuana was uh, made illegal in the United States. Up until that period of time, it was not illegal. Um, there were political reasons why that occurred, but it was sold to us uh, through a movie called Reefer Madness. Uh, that basically shared with the people that if you smoke pot, you would go crazy and want to kill people. Um, I've honestly never seen a stoner with that level of motivation, to be honest with you. But, uh, you know, but that was kind of what was sold to us. And so laws were created to punish people. I grew up in Montana. Uh, one minute. Um, just to give you an example, I grew up in Montana. Um, I graduated from high school in the early 70s. The penalty for possession of a single joint of marijuana was one year in the county jail with a thousand dollar fine. If you possessed two, you were considered a drug dealer and you did 10 years in the state penitentiary. You know, um, you didn't find a lot of kids in, the, in high school smoking pot. You know, I don't necessarily agree with those laws, but they were an interesting form of deterrent. And so those are the kinds of things that we're looking at. The other part of that mixed message was here in 1936, we're told marijuana will make you crazy, but in 1942, a very, thing, very little known, but, but very, very uh, explanatory little documentary was made by the War Department called Him for Victory. This taught people exactly how to grow marijuana. And the reason they were growing it was because the word cannabis comes from the Latin language and translated into English, it means cannabis. And this is the product that was used to make cannabis during World War II, which they needed a lot of. And so they taught American uh, farmers how to do this. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, and the mixed message was, hey, if you smoke pot, you'll go crazy, but if you grow it, we'll win a major world conflict. And ever since that period of time, we have had these, these kinds of mixed messages that have occurred over time. So thank you very much. Paul, like I said, fascinating. All right, our next uh, speaker is Mr. Scott Depew. Scott, he's a local firefighter. Oh, I did that again. And a parent um, who's lost his dynamic, energetic, athletic, and academically successful high school age son, Ryan, to an accidental drug overdose in April of 2008. He and his lovely wife, Charlene, are here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, <clears throat> good evening. Uh, my name is Scott. It's my wife, Charlene. We're from the Ryan Solution Foundation. Um, I, too, am a parent of a teen. Uh, an eternal teen. Uh, April 10th of this year will be the sixth anniversary of the day that we lost our son to an accidental overdose. Um, first, let me tell you how absolutely thrilled I am to be here and how absolutely impressed I am how many people are here and how absolutely impressed I am the information you're getting. Um, this didn't seem like it was available or the message was much different when Ryan was a teenager. Um, I'm supposed to be speaking as a parent and how to deal with this as a parent and um, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, I know that we had some time constraints. Um, I'm going to go through some stuff. I'm going to hopefully not rehash too much that's been gone over because they have done a terrific job tonight. 
Um, one thing that I heard that really hit a point with me was um, ignoring it. Um, it's a long, dark road. The idea that your kids could be using drugs or alcohol at such a young age is it's just not something that we want to even look at straight in the eye. Um, my belief, as far as parents go, we have to work on evolving as parents. Um, think of when your teen was in grade school and they came home and they said, Mom, Dad, the worst thing has happened. The wor it's the absolute worst. What? What happened? I, I'm failing math. As a parent, uh, and talking to a lot of parents, one of the things we're programmed to do is take a large problem and break it into a bunch of small problems. Yeah? Makes sense? Let's look at your quizzes. Let's talk to your teacher. Let's look at your tests. Let's look at your homework. Maybe we'll get a tutor, and we'll try and figure out some way to improve this grade. We'll break it up into small problems. The problem is, is that we as parents don't evolve very well. Ryan consistently wore too much cologne. Well, he's a ladies' man. Always had a bottle of Visine in his pocket and was sleeping in until noon or 2 o'clock on Saturday. Well, you know what? These kids have got to get up at 5.30 in the morning. They don't go to bed till 10 or 11 o'clock at night. They're exhausted. They're growing kids. They need their sleep. And they want to look good, so they're using Visine. Um, uh, big lighters or um, being rebellious. Well, what teen isn't being rebellious, right? All teens are rebellious. My belief is the problem here is we take those, those each individual instances and we, we, walk, we talk them away versus taking them and putting them together, taking the, mound, the mole hills and putting them into a mountain, asking ourselves a, a very tough question, do we have a bigger problem here? Um, I have a, a list of signs and symptoms from uh, being tardy, changing friends, no longer hanging out at home, drop in grades, drop in appearance, um, drug paraphernalia. Each of these things, with the exception of drug paraphernalia and them actually doing the drugs in front of you, each of them could be talked away as just we, we could make an excuse for it. But if you're seeing five or six of these signs and symptoms, you need to ask yourself seriously, is there a problem here? Um, the data still says that we as parents are not approaching the subject with our kids. And we're setting them up for failure. We're setting them up for failure in so many different ways. We are um, not talking about our genetic history. We want to leave those, those skeletons in the closet. You know, if my dad was alive today and, and he didn't tell me that, you know, hey, you know what, Scott, I have a lot of cardiac issues. You know, I've, I've had a stint, you know, and I'm the inattentive son maybe. If he doesn't tell me that and I go out and I eat all the cheeseburgers, chocolate chip cookies, chocolate shakes, fries, my wife's favorite um, elephant ears. I'm a, at risk to have a heart attack, just like my father. Why would we not have a discussion with our kids about the history of drugs in our family? Do you have somebody that's been addicted? Um, it, we're just making a huge mistake. We're making a huge mistake. Um, understanding that the kids of today are not the kids that we were. Um, we, I, would take a shot of whiskey, drop it in a glass of beer, and gulp it down. Today, they're taking a bowl of whiskey, dropping it in a mixing bowl of beer, and gulping it down. They're looking for the instant, for the now, and that's the way they've been raised. They, they don't know the world without the internet. They don't know the world without DVDs. They don't know the world in VHS cassette and some of us, yes, eight-track tapes. 
it's instant for them. And, and uh, as like um, the doctor said, you know, they take one uh, THC gummy and they don't get the desired effect, so they take three more. They, they don't know what they're doing. They're looking for instant gratification right now. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I, I am so happy for Kim and Stephanie. We met two years ago. I'll never forget eating at the diner. Um, Kim bought a pie for her daughter's volleyball team. Um, where this has come, and she was absolutely right. Um, grasshopper, well done. <laughs> um, we've got to get talking about this. We will stand in line at coffee or at McDonald's or in line for the restaurant, and we will talk about how great the Seahawks are, how horrible the Mariners are, but we will not talk about the number one accidental killer in our state, and that is prescription drugs. Washington is, is last I knew, one of 16 states in America that prescription drugs, prescription drug overdose surpasses car accidents and accidental death. We don't talk about that. And we don't talk about we have become our kids' drug dealers. I heard a stat this last week at another forum. Um, One dollar for every milligram of Vicodin. So 120 milligram Vicodin is $120. If I'm not mistaken, my last number I heard, uh, an ounce of heroin is 25 bucks. This is what we're dealing with. Um, it's your house. It's their room. It's your house. One, I, when I first started this, I said, Scott, it's, it's you every day. 365 days, it's an every day of the year job. And I said, Scott, you know what? I talk to myself a lot. If you go and tell parents this, they're never going to invite you back. <laughs> what I try and tell parents is, you know what? We have reminders on our phones, right? Everyone's got a smartphone. We do our laundry, change the bed, take out the garbage. How about once every two weeks or once a month, you set a reminder on your phone and, and says, you know what? I'm going to walk around this house. I'm going to go in my kid's bedroom as a third person and ask myself, is there anything in here that would lead me to believe that they could be using drugs? And you really have to do that as a third person. Because again, as a parent of your child, you can explain some stuff away. Um, education, it's huge. A um, lot of information tonight. Um, I don't want to, again, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, do we want to get to the panel probably? Would that be a good idea? All right. Thank you very much.